Good morning. My name is Joe. My pronouns are he and him, and it is good to be with you today. And greetings to all of you on Zoom as well. I think I'm looking at the right spot. It's been a while. Elijah, or I'm going to get this wrong all day. It's Elisha, not Elijah. Elisha was surrounded. When Elisha's assistant woke up in the morning to get the fire started, they went out to find an army, horses and chariots surrounding the whole city. How about a little adrenaline to go with your morning cup of coffee? They went running to Elisha. Wake up, wake up. There's an army surrounding the city. What are we going to do? We're doomed. And Elisha replied, Do not be afraid, for there are more with us than there are with them. Let's back up for a minute. Elisha had kind of gotten himself into this predicament. This is a Bible story from 2 Kings chapter 6, somewhere around the 800s BCE. This story comes from a relatively minor skirmish between the kingdom of Israel and the neighboring kingdom of Aram. The king of Aram entered Israel, apparently looking to pick a fight. Quite literally looking, in this case. He wanted a confrontation with the army of Israel, but they kept on avoiding him. This was before satellite technology. As the story goes, Elisha kept sending messages to the king of Israel. Hey, the Arameans, uh, they set up their army camp over there. Steer clear of that. And then when the Arameans would move, Elisha sent another warning. Watch out. They went that way, and so on. And apparently this happened so many times that the king of Aram was convinced that one of his people was selling his secrets to the enemy. It's not us, they said. It's that Elisha, the prophet of Israel. Somehow he knows even the things you say in your bedroom. He's directing the army of Israel. So the king sent the Aramean army to Elisha's city by night, and they surrounded his city with their horses and chariots. And that's when Elisha's servant woke him up in terror. But Elisha said to the servant, Do not be afraid, for there are more with us than there are with them. And when the servant opened their eyes, they saw behind the enemy army was another army, horses and chariots of fire, the army of God. Amazing. When the Arameans attacked, Elisha prayed and asked God to strike them with blindness. And God did. The whole army of Aram went blind, unable to see, totally confused. So Elisha called out to them, Hey, you've got the wrong guy here. You're actually in the wrong city. Follow me, I'll take you to Elisha, to the city where you can find this prophet of God. So this blinded army followed this stranger, and Elisha led them a whole day's journey, 12 miles through the hills to the south, straight into Samaria, the capital city of Israel. When they arrived, God unblinded them, and they could now see that they were inside the stronghold of Israel. They were surrounded by Israel's army. But when the king of Israel went to Elisha and said, let me kill them, Elisha rebuked him as well. Hey, these aren't your prisoners. You didn't capture them. I did. And I command you to give them food and water and then let them go. So the king of Israel made a great feast for his enemies sent them on their way. And after that, the Arameans never came back. They no longer came raiding into the land of Israel. Fantastic story. Raises a lot of questions. I know some of us are quick to wonder, well, did that really happen? Fair enough. The moment that sticks out to me is that moment when the servant of Elisha, desperately afraid because of the size of the army, comes and says, we are doomed. And Elisha responds, no, you're not seeing the whole picture. In reality, there are more with us than with them. Do not be afraid. There's so much more than you can see. That's a theme of Elisha's career as a prophet. Time after time, people brought their problems to Elisha, desperate for help. Some of the stories are delightfully mundane, like the time Elisha's students were chopping down trees, their schoolhouse wasn't big enough and they needed a bigger place to to be. One of them was chopping away at this tree, the head of his axe flew off and landed in the Jordan River. So this student went running to his teacher, my axe head fell in the river and it wasn't even mine, it was one I borrowed, what are we going to do? Elisha went to the river, okay, point to it, where did it fall in? All right, then he cut off a stick 
threw the stick into the water, and in the King James Version, the iron did swim. The axe head floated to the surface. The student grabbed it. Problem solved. Another time, Elisha's followers were gathered for a teaching session. When lunchtime came, Elisha told his servant to make them some stew. So they went out and found a wild vine with a bunch of gourds on it. Haven't seen these before. Don't really know what they are, but they look tasty. Bad news. He cut them up and threw them in the stew. Just a couple of bites in, the students started to cry out, Teacher, there is death in the pot. Hebrew is such a poetic language. There is death in the pot. Elisha went calmly over, grabbed some ordinary flour, threw the flour in the pot. Try it now. should be fine. And it was. There was nothing harmful in the pot. Other Elisha stories are a bit more serious, like Naaman, the enemy general with leprosy. When the prophets and healers in his own country couldn't help him, this powerful general humili- humiliated himself by going to his enemy privately and asking for their prophet to help. And Elisha made Naaman humble himself further by washing in the dirty waters of the Jordan River. But Naaman did, and Elisha's word was true. His leprosy was healed on the spot. Then there was the time when one of Elisha's students died suddenly, leaving behind a wife and two small children, and a massive debt. The widow came to Elisha. A creditor has come demanding payment. I have nothing to give them. If I can't pay, they're going to take my children as slaves. The only thing the woman had left, the only thing she owned, was one jar of oil. So Elisha asked her to borrow as many empty containers as she could from her neighbors. She brought them into her house. When she did that, she filled her house with as many containers as she could find. Elisha told her, okay, take that jar of oil that you have and start pouring it into these other containers. And she started pouring until the first borrowed container was full. She set that aside. Her son brought her another one. She poured her oil into that one until it was full, and then another one, and another one, until all the borrowed containers had been filled. Now, Elisha said, go and sell that oil, and you can pay your debts. Keep your children, and you'll have enough to live on. And so on. There are lots of these kinds of stories. People brought their problems to Elisha, and he said, don't be afraid. There's more going on here than you can see. Something to that effect. No, I know. These are magical tales. It's hard for some of us to wrap our modern brains around them. It's easy to get sidetracked over what really happened or whether or not I can expect God to make my tools float the next time I accidentally throw them into the river or at least keep that mystery dish from poisoning everyone at the next church potluck. Some folks choose to see these stories about, as stories about faith and power. It may be that if you have the faith of Elisha, if you follow the right teacher, pray the right prayers with the right level of sincerity, God will solve your problems, multiply your food and your oil, trick your enemies, even raise your dead. To me, that sounds more like magic than faith. But that's another argument for another time. Today, I think those stories point to a broader truth on a different level. As I said, these stories of Elisha follow a pattern. People bring their problems to the prophet because they've tried everything they can think of. We're stuck. We can't do this. We are out of time. We're out of resources. There's death in the pot. You can't escape death in the pot. But the prophet is not stuck. There is another way. There is something you haven't tried, something you haven't seen yet because you haven't been looking for it. These are stories of wonder, of creativity, of persistence, of refusing to accept the inevitable outcome in search of something better. Don't be afraid. You can't see it, but there are more with us than there are against us. It seems important in this story that the fiery chariots and horses of God are not called into action to come down and crush the enemy. That would be the obvious move. The Old Testament hardly holds back and the God's power is on our side and so we're going to crush you department. But rather than crushing, Elisha points to this power as incentive to try something risky and creative. We have so much power that we don't need to crush them. We can go out to them. We can trick them. We can capture them. We can feed them. We can afford to let them go. We can win not by force, but by respect, by grace. And just a little bit of outright deception. 
those Ten Commandments must not have been written in stone even back when they were written in stone. That's the faith of Elisha, the power of transformation. It looks like this, but really it's this. You've done the analysis, you have it sussed, you're out of options, it feel like, feels like you have no choice. But what if there's something that you haven't thought of yet? What if there's an option you haven't tried? What if your analysis is limited, it's biased, just wrong? These weeks, some of us have been thinking a lot about the pacifism of our Anabaptist ancestors. How can we be pacifist in the face of war in Ukraine? Our Western governments are working extremely hard to stay out of the physical war for a number of reasons. But there are plenty of calls for violence as well. We've heard threats of assassination, posturing about red lines and no-fly zones, covert missions, etc. We're certainly doing as much as we feel that we can get away with to arm the Ukrainians and use economic sanctions to make the Russians feel the pain. We have to fight back. We have to stand up to the bully. We have to protect the innocent. I get that, for sure. I feel the horror of attacks on civilians, on a maternity hospital, on nuclear power sites, reports of thermobaric weapons, the likelihood of chemical weapons. I am scared and disgusted and horrified and outraged, and I feel that impulse. We have to fight back. We have to. We can't do nothing. Elisha, wake up. The enemy is at the gates. We are surrounded. We are doomed. Don't be afraid, for there are more with us than there are with them. There's more than you know, more than you can see. That's one of the key assumptions of my pacifism. In the face of military aggression, it feels like we have these two choices. We surrender or we fight back, kill or be killed, with us or against us, defend it or lose it. That binary runs deep. It feels instinctual and primal and natural. It's fight or flight. But our pacifist tradition questions that narrow view. It's a false binary. There are more than two options. We always have a choice. We could choose to talk, to negotiate. We could choose to help, to problem solve. We could choose to stand with rather than standing against. We could choose to show mercy and forgiveness. We could choose the way of Elisha to surprise and confuse, to do the totally unexpected, to meet the needs of the enemy, to surprise them with a feast. We could choose the way of CPT, now community peacemaker teams, using the power of presence and documentation and storytelling to get in the way of the machines of violence. We could choose the way of the martyrs in our tradition, to choose to suffer, to choose to die, as Jesus did. Not all of those are good options for every situation. I haven't done the work to imagine how those or other responses might fit into this a response to the crisis in Ukraine. But other people have. You don't have to take my word for it. People are living this in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Iraq, in Colombia, all around the world. Coming from me, this is just a bunch of hypotheticals, but the witness is there if we choose to look for it. Maybe we should. Maybe that could be part of our, the response of our congregation to look for those third way stories and to share them with each other. That's our tradition as pacifists, not just that war and killing is morally wrong, but that there's always a third way, always another option. I'm sure there are Christian leaders around the world dusting off books about just war theory right now. My cynical take on just war theory is that it's usually brought along after the fact, after, after the decision has already been made, a justify war theory. Taken in good faith, though, a key criteria for a just war is that war must be a last resort. Force may be, only, may be used only after all peaceable, peaceful and viable alternatives have been seriously tried and exhausted or are clearly not practical. Do we ever seriously try all peaceful and viable alternatives? We dismiss a lot of them. We underfund and undercut and assume the worst about many of them. We corrupt them with our biases of self-righteousness and revenge and need to win. But in my highly idealistic opinion, that's a kind of scarcity mindset that our theme points to. Scarcity of ideas, 
scarcity of creativity, scarcity of imagination. War is a self-fulfilling prophecy. There is always another way. There's an abundance of options. There are more with us than against us. The invitation of Elisha is to trust that we do not see everything, to embrace our limits as the potential for transformation. I see that as the call of Jesus as well, not just on an international level, but on the level of personal relationships also. We see that in our scripture reading from John 12. Jesus' friend, Mary, wastes a treasure in a moment, pouring out a year's wages worth of essential oil onto Jesus' feet. A year's wages, think of all the good that could have done for the poor. That's the treasurer's perspective in the story. You either use it wisely or you waste it. This is actually what you want from a treasurer. He's on point with the mission statement of the group. We are here to help the poor. We're here to bring justice for the oppressed, to feed the hungry, all of that. Jesus said so himself. This treasure could have gone to that purpose, but now it's just gone. It's all over the floor. That perspective would not be out of place in one of our church business meetings. There would be some very pointed questions raised if I spent 50 grand on, on anointing oil for Ash Wednesday. You should raise those questions. <laughs> but here Jesus rebukes the treasurer. Leave Mary alone. She sees something that you do not. You're right that our mission is to serve the poor. But that's not only about charity. Even this great gift would not have made a dent in the poverty of the world. So there are other tools in our belt. I'm doing something different this time. You heard me say humanity does not live by bread alone. My way is about more than physical hunger, more than money, more than equality, more than your ideas of justice. I have a new way. Can you try to see it? I'm paraphrasing a whole lot. Jesus' literal statement there, you have poor people with you always, has been widely misinterpreted to say that Jesus didn't care about economic justice or that he was interested only in spiritual salvation that's more important than ending poverty. But that's another false binary. It's not either one or the other. It's actually a yes and, and Jesus is holding these two together. The treasurer saw Mary's wealth and made his judgment on that basis alone. But Mary had her own story. This jar of essential oil was originally meant for her brother's burial. But Jesus had brought Lazarus back from the tomb. So now this treasure, it meant far more than the monetary value. This was salvation to her. She saw within this more than money. She saw a possibility that had been unimaginable days before. And it turns out this treasurer, he had his own story as well. His binary of waste not, want not, well, that was not actually the efficient, productive, helpful tool that he believed. His very narrow focus, you've got to use this well or, or it's going to be lost, well, that had actually led him to corruption. He had his hand in the cookie jar. This was Judas the betrayer. He was so committed to the mission as he understood it that he ended up undermining what Jesus was trying to do entirely. This storyteller piles on Judas as the villain here. But of course, he wasn't the only one of Jesus' disciples to be so invested in their vision of what they thought Jesus should be doing that they missed the broader picture of what Jesus was actually doing. And of course, I do that as well. I project my own stories onto others with judgment. What are they doing? That'll never work. That's ah, not what a church is supposed to be about. What a waste of resources. They need to get their priorities straight and so on. My internal dialogue is not quite on the same level as just war theory, but it has the same scarcity mindset. I know the right way, and if that's not it, well then that must be wrong. But every Mary has their own story, whether it makes sense to me or not. Every Judas has their story, even when I disagree with what they're doing. They have their reasons. It looks like this, but it's actually this. Elisha saw a world of possibilities, a world of wonder, and that let him do things that others saw as impossible. Jesus saw the third way, embraced the third way, and that let him embrace people that others thought of as impossible. What kind of world do we live in? Is this a world of scarcity and inevitability, or is it a world of wonder, possibility, and transformation? 
what kind of world do we choose to live in? I suspect that how we choose to see the world goes a long way to create that reality. May God give us the grace and imagination and courage to follow.